Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are literally on the last possible edge of May. It is a 31 day month, May, if you didn't notice. But yes, just before you know it, it's summertime, at least for the people on this side of the, you know, the world. It's like wintertime on the other side. It is summertime, full fledged, full bore. And like, before you know it, it's going to like this. Watch. You're going to be in September, October, and November. You're going to wake up and you're going to be right in the thick of like the machine gun conference season. And, and like 2024 is, uh, is going to be like literally on your doorstep. Watch. You'll see. But before we get into all of that, let's just get some housekeeping out of the way. Because like, you know, once we get it done, we can we can talk about the good stuff. So mspinitiative.com. Once you learn how to spell initiative, the rest is good. mspinitiative.com. This is where we have everything that we do. So this very session is being recorded. It will be under sessions here in audio and video format. Go back, rewind. You know, uh, you'll bother my buddy Adam over here and be like, wait a minute, Adam said at 22 minutes and 30 seconds this. Be like, okay, cool. Look, now you can go back and ask him about it. We are doing an in-person event this year. We parked the bus from the Channel Strong Tour after years of being on the road. We're doing our first hotel style event, two days, all education, uh, workshops. We want you to walk away with something started, not death by PowerPoint. So take the 14th and 15th of August, circle them on your schedule, costs absolutely nothing to join us other than you have to get there. I'm not charging you to like come to a conference or anything. Like we're gonna cover you, we're gonna make sure you have a good time and you're fed well and you're, you're networking, but please come and learn at MSP Community Minds. We'll post a little bit more about this in the next week because uh, I think our schedule is kind of hashed out and we can talk to you about it. Then are the various block parties we do along the year. So we did London, we did Prague, we did a small uh, like dinner drinks event at MSP GeekCon in Orlando uh, last week. Coming up, Dublin. So if you're headed to DattoCon Dublin, you got to want to go to this one. Hit that page up, register. Then we have the MSP Community Boat Party working with Taylor Business Group and the guys who are running the big, big conference. So uh, if you like five-story five story mega yacht cruises down the intercoastal in Fort Lauderdale, that one is for you. Doing one in Miami. Uh, we'll be working again with the, the fine folks running DattoCon. So uh, if you like Florida, <laughs> next one's for you too. Our last one of the year, Orlando. This is where we brought in the All-American Rejects last year. About to announce our band for this year. I promise you're going to love it. We have some community offers, so check that out. And then we have an industry calendar where basically anybody who's ever doing anything in the channel, we dump into one place. So you know what's going on. If there's something missing there, let us know. Just submit it and we'll get that on the calendar. That is all of the housekeeping. As you can see, we like to keep very busy. There is no dull moments here at MSP Initiative. Without further ado, guy I've known for a long time. He's been in the MSP sandbox uh for for quite some time adam how are you doing today my friend i'm doing pretty good george that is pretty good. incredible msp initiative you guys do a ton i love seeing your stuff i love seeing the events and so forth you do that you guys throw some fun have some fun throw some great parties so Appreciate i love seeing all this stuff i love seeing hey, the big man, you know like uh, it's big small, rv it's, it's <laughs> i know the rv hey listen we did hundreds i feel like over a hundred thousand miles i'm sure that's not the exact number but um man the channel strong you know tour was awesome like it definitely served the purpose during the pandemic took all those years and years and years of eagles tailgating here in philadelphia and put it to good use uh so i really appreciated seeing the country by road by the way all those flyover states there's some good stuff there i promise you uh but there's a lot of good msp and it shops out there and um some pretty clever people pretty pretty clever people oh, yeah. out there which i'll be honest with you when we ask a lot of them, hey, you know, like other than us coming into your backyard and you coming out for like, you know, a couple of beers and a sandwich, why don't we ever see you at like the, the stuff that's, you know, the conferences and the events when like, you know, it's not pandemic times. You know, Adam, we a lot of people do not go to those events. I, you know, it's very interesting. Interesting. Yeah, it's yeah. just it's something, you know, I uh, just with this whole pandemic that there was it just you I know you just like, well, I'm done just not going anywhere and you're like whatever i'm getting a bus so we're gonna go downtown it, it was incredible just to watch that uh so uh, it's, it's good it's, for everyone it, for sure for sure so um yeah I, I, what a little bit of background on me 
I would um, love to like, yep, you you almost know the format, which I didn't even prep you on. I just said buckle up. So for sure, really about this time, like especially for people who haven't been on, you know, this is your first time here. Yeah, you know, I like to like rewind a little bit. Like everybody has such a journey sometimes through IT land, and I'd love to learn what yours was like. Yeah, for sure. I'm going to rewind it all the way back to uh, high school. <laughs> uh, I graduated high school, was hugely into computers, hugely. There we go. There's a new word. Uh, <laughs> so uh started my business uh, right after high school. Um, I found that I wasn't really like capable of being an employee because I really want to set my own schedule. I had ambitions of running my own business and setting my own rules and having employees and so forth. So I set out and started my own MSP business in 2002. Um, so that's like where I first got into the industry. It, it was an MSP business, but I didn't even know what an MSP was other than I had reoccurring contracts. They were paying me a monthly fee for my labor. Um, and so I was like, well, if I'm going to do this thing, I need to really niche it. So I niched in radiology healthcare, which was really hot because they were doing wow. You know, the uh, hospitals were switching from, you know, analog systems to digital systems at that time. So that was really, really seeing doctors, you know, you know, they used to throw up those old films, right, on those glass light boxes. And uh, now they're all touching computer screens and reading x-rays and getting a lot more detail in there. So I uh, started doing all that. Um, my journey kind of really started lifting off in 2006 when I, um, uh, got ConnectWise in my business because we were struggling with growth. Uh, so we got just, it was actually just called ConnectWise back then. That was the only software they had and, uh, went through 2007, 2008, obviously everybody understands kind of the market crashes and dynamics. And, you know, we had, we were growing business like crazy. Uh, we had about 25 30 employees at that time i'll be very straightforward and open and honest like um I'm putting myself out there i lost my business lost my house short sold crashed like i had a financial disaster in 2008 um do what in 2008 2008 yep um i just wasn't running my business by the numbers right you have you hire a consultant you expect them to be like hey you know watch out for this watch out for this um and yeah nobody was saying really anything to me i was just spending money like crazy and it was just a really humbling experience to go through and you realize man i really need to like this is the bread and butter i need to take this serious right it's no longer high school you know getting out of high school it's it's like i now feed families and, you know, so it was like, man, I felt so bad being a horrible leader uh, at that particular time that I really buckled down, focused on what proper KPIs are needed in a business, really integrated my systems um, all into ConnectWise. And so we understood the ConnectWise platform more um, and uh, started changed and shifted my business. So we went down from 30 employees, 25, 30 employees, roughly down to 10 and we started building back up to about 20 employees in 2010, 2011. Um, and then I just was like, man, I really kind of found my calling, found my, found my passion, teaching, educating, and, and like, this is my story, right? And I don't want other MSP business leaders, engineers, service managers have to go through those experiences um, because it's painful. It is painful for my family to come home when my wife's pregnant and be like, hey, honey, we kind of have to move because I'm short selling the house because I simply can't afford it because my business is losing money, like absolute crazy. I'm borrowed to the max. Right. And um, that's no way to run your life. That's no way to run a business. And so I was like, I, I, I want to start teaching, educating MSPs on how to manage their business properly. Wow. So that's uh, I, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Cause I mean, listen, we, have the guys on service from service leadership peters on you know on the regular and we always talk about what's what's good what's bad what's in between and you know i you know i come to find that not only do they have the math at a macro right they, they have a, a large yeah. amount of data that they pull in but just talking to people on the regular i'm not so sure how many people are running their business properly i i kind of feel like people run it on the edge whether they realize it or not 
And that's the problem, I think. But we'll get into that a bit deeper. Okay. So like, when did you make the shift from MSP to what's now your thing, you know, Sierra Pacific Consulting, right? Like, what was yep. there like a hard, was it 2012, 2015? Like, what was that cut over day yeah, you said? And I'm for sorry. Sure. So, yeah, so I was kind of, I, I was just kind of doing a consulting thing while owning my MSP business, right? And it was kind of like one foot on the boat, one foot on the dock. And it's like, well, consulting's taken off. And it's like, well, I need to go that direction. So in 2016, I sold my MSP practice to a business partner I had in that. And then really created Sierra Pacific Group, uh, which today is now over 40 consulting uh, team members and really just amazing experienced systems consultants specializing in crafting really tailored solutions to technology business leaders around the ConnectWise ecosystem, right? So integrating the tool sets and all that stuff and, and making sure we have the businesses structure software set up so they can measure appropriate KPIs and all that stuff. So it's just because that is that is my passion. And that's my drive, right? Um, because running an MSP business is hard in itself. And it's harder if you don't have the systems properly configured, like really hard. <laughs> so, you know, okay. all this liability, let's, security let's and all that stuff. Let's expand on that for a second. But before I do, you know, I, I, you know whether we like it or not, here, here is Mr. Keith Nelson. Our, our favorite <laughs> in California, other than Adam, of course. Oh, we're bringing him in. I like yeah, that. Nice, Keith. Like let's 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 bring the guy in. He has some good thoughts. How you doing today, Keith? Excellent. How are you? Good. Did the did, did the Cowboys sign DeAndre Hopkins? You you hoping and praying for that? I'm I'm hoping for that. I, I really am. By the okay. way, this is the first time I've seen uh, Adam not babysitting uh, Sean. Thank you for all the time you babysit him when I'm not around. Oh boy. It is a oh small boy. sandbox that we all live in. Yeah, I know. Hello, I know. Sean. I know you're out there somewhere in the internet. How are you? Okay. So let's let's zoom back, Adam, because in my IT company, my MSP out of Philly area, my really small story was I was running dynamic CRM as a Microsoft partner for years, 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 right? They gave it away. My Dell server crashed. Okay. My Axiom, not what's now Axiom, the original, original Axiom, right? All your data all the time. You remember that tagline? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, how about none of your data all the time? <laughs> and so their thing broke and I lost everything. And like, I was literally like running the business blind for 90 days without anything, right? Like you're talking about every service ticket, every password, every invoice. And um, I get emailed, you know, spam blasted by ConnectWise at the exact right time, right in the middle of all of that. It's like, hey. Check out ConnectWise. I was like, okay, Dexter, how much does this cost? And I don't ever want to see another server ever again. He's like, oh, yeah, it'll take you six weeks to set up. That's it. You'll be running, no problem, turnkey, car will be driving. I was like, really that easy? He's like, oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. By the way, how about six months, not six weeks? I don't know where six weeks came from, but I definitely got missold. But I did buy, I learned more about how ConnectWise worked by buying lab tech at the time than like by actually going through and setting, like going through the process of getting ConnectWise, man, which is now called Manager BSA, I keep on changing the title, but ConnectWise is the original product set up. And like eventually, it was funny, it's like I got recommended to an outside consultant at the time. They ended up going to work for ConnectWise internally. And I was <laughs> like, this is just such a small pool of people, clearly. But like, here's the problem. <clears throat> Just like you've talked to anyone who's ever deployed Salesforce or HubSpot, NetSuite, big systems, right? ServiceNow, I mean, pick whatever you want. These things don't just, I mean, the first time you turn on an RMN, it doesn't just run. Like you got to feed the machine, right? So like, I, I, I wonder, and maybe you have the answer, Adam, and maybe like complexity of the business, size of the business, I'm sure plays into it, but what is the average inf implementation time to like do it right? It's not six weeks. That much I know. No, no. Back in the original days, they were literally heavy into that six week thing. I mean, it was like, hey, yeah, it's up and running, but that's not really an implementation. You can have a service board that comes in and you have your tickets flowing in through an email connector. But truly, to to really get a system fully up and and, and you feel like your team is has momentum behind the tool, understands the tool, and so forth, it's at least twelve months. That's not to say that you can't like have good momentum at six months, 
Um, but six months is definitely like the minimum, but 12 months is like, okay, cool. We understand the systems. We understand the processes. And because it is a big beast, you're managing three core aspects of your business, sales, service, and finance, which is your operations, right? And um, all three of those areas take quite a bit. And, and then it's like, okay, you realize, do you have the right people in the right seat? Okay, the people, some people just don't simply aren't putting in the time appropriately. And it's like, okay, I'm retraining and retraining and retraining. And then it's like, okay, well, this person might not just be a fit for the organization. So then it's like, you got to replace this person. It's like, you have to, it's like, it's a struggle. It's a big struggle to make sure. And so that's where it's, you know, you hear all the flack in the marketplace. And also it's like a properly implemented system will really drive results for your business. And it's like, you have to change your processes. You have to change your, sometimes your people. And it's unfortunate, um, but that's just the way the software kind of operates, right? It's not okay. ConnectWise's fault. I got I got a couple of good questions that really feed. By the way, I don't think you're ever done. I I, I, look no. I I believe that, but let's be honest, right? There needs to be concrete first, right? Like I want to, I want to build on top of something that's not going to quicksand on me, right? I can't tell you how many times, maybe Keith, I don't know how many times you've heard it. Somebody's re-implemented the PSA again. We're I, just going through moving back to ConnectWise and um, using Adam's company to help us. You know, we're in the middle of talking to them, sending them up. We, and and part of it is. You know, for years, we, we just outran our problems. It go like, we weren't really good taking care of it. We just made so much money, it didn't matter. Um, and now it's really something you're going, um, I just sat on a training seminar with Continuum or ConnectWise RMM. They keep changing the names. I don't know what the hell they're called anymore. But it's not to bash the product because I think it's good, but you're going, it's not very intuitive when you first look at it. And the guy started showing me, oh, I said, you don't have this, this, and this. He goes, oh, yeah, it's all right here. And you go, well, I would never have found it. And I think that's true in all those solutions. And we design software. We, we think our software is perfect. You know, someone says, you didn't put this in. We go, yeah, we did. We just didn't put it in the right place. And UI, and UX, it, right? <laughs> that's yeah. part of the game. <laughs> and so I think it's awfully efficient to hire someone like a um, Sierra Pacific Adams Group, and just say, I mean, take everything you've done wrong and make mine right. That's kind of what I'm looking at, right? Everything you've yeah. learned over all this consulting, make my bills look pretty, make my community, make my tickets look pretty, focus on the customer experience, and and um, let us just go do what we make a whole lot of money doing, which is. Well, the, I, I don't stuff. think anyone will argue that this is a self implementer because it surely is not. Not I wouldn't recommend anyone do that. And that applies to anything that you're doing, right? This isn't a yeah. wizard. Click, 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 go. Right? Let's be honest. Let me, I'm going to hot fire some questions at you. And I'm sure you're not going to be surprised by these, but they come up all the time. Might as well ask while we're in the session. Why isn't the PSA a good CRM? And why, why are people going outside of what's there? to other systems in order to, you know, what they feel is get a proper CRM in place? <laughs> these are these are very challenging questions, right? Um, so there's, there's a couple aspects and, and to talk to Keith a little bit and then I'll, then I'll get to your question real okay. quick. So uh, Keith is right. And it's like, it's an ever evolving system. It's ever evolving because your business is ever evolving. So there's typically really quite a few plateaus in your business, right? You have the get to the million dollars, get to that once and we get to that million dollar mark. Then it's like, okay, let me get to that $2 million mark. And once you hit that 2 million, it's like, cool, I got that momentum. Then it's like that 5 million because each have these different plateaus you have to get through. And after five, it gets to 10 and then 10 is typically about 20 million where it's like, cool. Yeah, I got my system scaled. I got it set up. I got it structured, right? It's the ever evolving MSP business. And, and when it comes to the CRM aspects, you know, I'm not going to lie. It's kind of not very a good area in ConnectWise. It just is simply not. Uh, the intuitive tools that are out there in the marketplace, we use HubSpot. We recommend HubSpot. Uh, that integrates really well with ConnectWise uh, through a third-party application tool. Um, things that just, you know, managing campaigns, managing uh, contacts, managing, uh, you know, workflows and automation, chats on the website, your entire website. You know, HubSpot has everything built in a single platform that is really, really amazing. I'm not here to sell HubSpot, but I'm here to, you know... In the ConnectWise piece, this is an area, it's like, 
should you own it or not? Right. And I think that they should just get their hands out of that marketing piece, just be done with it. And now I will also say though, they do have a really great advantage on the sales side of the CRM. So dealing with what they call ConnectWise Sell or ConnectWise CPQ is a really, really slick tool. And it does really like have an opportunity, having a pipeline all within ConnectWise. It, it, as long as it's configured, as long as the sales team is using it appropriately, that is a really, really great system. But it, when it comes to marketing, yeah, they just need to stay out of it. Okay. <laughs> you, know, you bring up a question, Adam. Yes, ConnectWise has that partner power hole with all the, you know, Marketopia, whatever it is, that when you're partner, you could send. They really are horrible about integrating it with their own solution. You know, it's like, or, or, or at least I missed it. You're going like, why doesn't importing my contacts and just doing something? I can't, again, I can't really speak to the specifics of that. That's getting into the technical details of, of the integration piece with between Marketopia and, and, and the marketing side of ConnectWise. I, I just find it challenging. And, and our advice is we do recommend client steer clear of it. Uh, Marketopia is a great player in the marketplace and they have a great solution, great tool. There's others out there. Um, uh, Binox MSP is another tool um, that's out there. I'm just throwing names out to make sure I give all the love to all the various different platforms out there, right? Um, you know, it, it's it's a big struggle. And I think that there's a big shift at ConnectWise. And, you know, being part of the advisory council, we talk about these things, right? We challenge ConnectWise to make sure they're on the right path. We challenge them to make sure they're doing the right things because they are really, really great at doing certain things. And then challenging when areas that they are falling on, right? And, and so this is where the marketing piece does come up occasionally. Um, and so we're there to help. And, and you know, there's third-party companies out there that do it really well. So hmm. hopefully okay. I answer your question. Where, where, I mean, obviously multiple people use, I mean, if there's any one just absolute golden hammer of, of the core ConnectWise, you know, manage, PSA, whatever you want to call it. It's just like integration is like legitimate, right? Like I, if one one would argue, if you look at all of the options on the market, you know, this is where they win, hands down, all day, every day, right? And that took decades, by the way, right? It didn't happen overnight. Can't tell you how many times I walked down IT Nation and it's like, man, you can spend a lot of money very quickly walking down the aisle here, but they're all integrated. Um, when you're helping people and, and, you know, listen, I appreciate the shiny object syndrome too. I can imagine that in the beginning of any, you know, cons consultation that you start, integrations is probably the first thing they want to turn on. My guess is that you tell them to hold off turning those knobs on until other things are set up. Oh, for sure. Definitely. So, so, you know, taking, we get a lot of feedback and, and it is around the ConnectWise is the open platform. I mean, George, your own software, Bevoy. It, it's, it, you know, it's really great. And it, it just, the integrations piece, and some people are like, I will say this, and I don't, it might be sound bad. MSP owners are tool consumers. They just will go buy any tools without even actually fully integrated in their business and having it properly integrated within their platforms. There is like 10 steps that need to be taken care of within the managed platform or PSA platform to make sure that the tool can actually be absorbed and used appropriately. Commonly, they get to a trade show. They're like, oh man, this is awesome. Sounds really great. And they want to buy the tool. Well, it's not working like it is, is it was when I got the demo. Well, your system's not set up appropriately because you didn't take the time to do the 10 steps prior to make sure everything's super efficient. And then you can bring on that tool. So if there's one word of advice, I know people are going to hate me, stop buying tools until you're ready to actually get it going in your platform, right? And that's, and, and sometimes it's like, hey, we have this tool, that tool, and then we come in and we're like, okay, cool, here, let's integrate it better. And we do have integration projects and so forth um, to help them out and leverage those software tools. All right, let's go back to like the foundation theory here. <clears throat> back when the Bellini brothers were behind the, the steering wheel, they would say, hey, you need to change your business processes. You need to change the flow of how your organization works to fit the system rather than make the system try and fit the organization. Do you believe that sentence? Oh, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, but I believe that there is, I, for one, was an engineer at Mind. 
I didn't know how to run a business. And so I needed a tool and a software to help guide me and coach me to build that structure and build that processes. So I am very much like you need to change your process and so forth to fit the software because the software is structured in a way that makes it for super efficient business operations from service sales and finance, how the handoff happened between those things. If you don't shift and, and a lot of MSP business owners are immature business owners because they're engineers, right? Uh, and their engineers are hard. I was one myself. And, you know, <laughs> and so I needed that structure. And I think a lot of people do need that structure. So um, I do agree with that statement. Okay. So how much of your company's services are first to retool the business's mindset on how the business runs before we even talk about software? For sure. So we have what's called a 30 day discovery session. So in our first or our first kind of 30 days of any pro project we jump into, we want to explore that we want to, hey, our, how is your systems configured? What is your mindset around this? We understand your processes and procedures that you have around each of these three core areas, sales, service, finance, right? Um, so we dig into that. And we basically after that 30 days, create a project a tailored project plan to get from point A to point B where they're pivotal or their peak performances in their particular business. And we typically try to structure it into where they actually want to be in the next short term. So we say three year term, we try to keep it short, because quite often, I, we do run into uh, businesses that are like, yeah, we're going to be 10 million next year. And it's like, really, are you prepared for that? And, and there's just a slightly different structure, right? Because there M&A is a big player in the marketplace as well. And there's a ton of projects around that. And it's like, that is a different ball game. It's it's so uh, I'll speak to one really cool tool that ConnectWise has out here today. It's called Modes Theory. I'm sure you've heard of it. ConnectWise.com/modes. Okay. Um, yeah, and and it's all around the mindset of the business owner, right? And that helps me understand. Hey, are they a startup mode? Are they a lifestyle business? Are they really enterprise builder type business? And, and that really kind of helps craft kind of the structure of what, how we need to set up the ConnectWise instances of PSA, CPQ, and uh, Automate and, and RMM, right? So, you know, it, it's it, it's a challenge for sure. So Okay. So, <clears throat> of course, you know, the person who swiped their credit card to buy all of this, right? They come in and they're like, hey, guys, could take a year for all this to kind of hash out. And they're like, oh, my God, I signed a, I only signed a one year <laughs> deal. I'm going to get to the end of the term and it's not going to even be set up yet. Like how, you know, are you reasonably asking people to run whatever they had before and whatever they just bought in parallel for a year? Or does it take a year to kind of start? but you're using it kind of, and then eventually, like you settle in, how does, how does that work? No, for sure. Our, our, so our project plans, great question. So our, our project plans are structured around because we understand MSP businesses need to be able to continue to do business. You, you can't simply stop their business and just implement something new. Um, smaller MSPs that are typically five or less employees and, and less than a million. It's like, those are the type that are like, yeah, just set us up. We'll change all our processes and we'll just execute and run. And, and they, again, have to make sure they're in the right mindset. Um, when it comes to larger businesses, typically what we like to do is identify their core area that they're frustrated with, right? They usually come to us because they have a pain point. Pain point could be around sales. They could be around service delivery. Procurement's a big one, how I'm ordering products and, and how am I actually delivering proposals to clients. Depending on their core area, so we try to focus on structuring those uh, things first and put a priority to those. Um, so because we can kind of move and shift things around to make sure, A, the client's happy, two, we actually have this year-long goal to achieve the results uh, as a scalable and integrated solution of ConnectWise systems. Interesting. All right. So let me zoom back and let me pick your brain in, in just a macro level, right? <clears throat> What are the, what's like the one or two top things that people come to you? Like they've been using this for a long time. They're existing, like, you know, they're not new to the platform, right? They've been using it, using it, using it. They come to you and they're like, yeah, I don't even know where to start and we need help. What are the top couple of things that, all, you know, that frequently pop up? As of lately, there's, you know, as well as I do, the financial technology systems have 
greatly increased in integration and capacity and 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 not capacity um what they do and what problems they solve right so you have the big players out there um which one was acquired and then not really announced and then you know one was another one was acquired was announced and there's right now probably majority of our project i want to say probably half the projects are coming through what we call chart of accounts projects people want to understand their finances more they want to align their chart of accounts to be able to measure the revenue that's coming in their door and measuring the cost of the things that uh, are going out, right? Because if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And it's super important that we align the revenue that's incoming to service boards, to the products that are being sold, right? And to agreements that are actually being sold. So they can say, hey, am I profitable in this particular line of service? Am I profitable making cloud revenue versus, you know, te 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 telephone uh, t uh, or even, uh, you know, what is it? Like uh, man just regular managed services, right? Or BDR services. We we want to line item those chart of accounts out. Um, and usually that's probably the first phase of most of our projects start there. And then once we kind of do that tuning, then it's like, oh, well, I need to now get my service boards and service team in line to make sure we're measuring these things, put in the time appropriately. Because again, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And so time is a big one. One of the biggest webinars we've ever conducted is around time entry. And this is a problem that's been an issue since I, 2002. I feel like I've heard this one forever, right? What, what, what is the magic answer to why people don't put their time in the system? Accountability. Okay. I'll take people it. are simply not holding other people accountable. And most of the time, it's the engineer who know, has the most knowledge, who is the most experienced, the highest paid, and is the worst time entry. And they think they're a great. Now, I will show you a great person who can be all those things and also get their time in on time. That's commonly what we see. <laughs> so, you know, Keith, I don't, I don't know if you're experiencing something like that to bring you into this conversation. I think it has to do with um, process. You know, you, you take, it's like, too much a ticket entry is like using a cannon to shoot a fly. So developing a system where you have a first level help desk that gets the ticket all set up and your you know, $75 an hour guy is doing clerical while your $200 an hour guy is solving problems and making quick entries with standard notes and so on. And and because uh, the other thing is when you get them to enter a ticket, they usually like to write a whole narrative on how awesomely technically smart they are. And, and, the, and the customer looks at that and goes, I don't know what you're talking about, quit sending me this crap. And it needs to be something more where I fixed your problem, please test it. If you have any other issues, get back with us. And the technical notes go internal or in knowledge base. So I think it's a, a real, developing that real process flow where you're, where you're not taking a guy that has a thousand things and doing clerical work. Okay, that's fair. Adam, how many people do you find just turned on the ticketing part of the system, which obviously is a focal point, but not maybe it's only 20% of what the system does, right? And then they're not using anything else, right? They're not using their tickets to, to, to get to invoicing. They're not using agreements. They're not using SLAs. You know, they're just using it as a ticketing system. Oh. I would say at least a third of the companies coming to us have just ticketing. Now, I will stress that most companies, when they first sign up, that's really all they want. I just want a ticketing managing system. And then, you know, they typically are sitting there for about a year. They're like, oh, well, it does this thing. Okay, well, let's try to look in that. They start venturing in these other areas themselves and start self-implementing. So, you know, that's where it's like, Typically, we see about three years into a project like that, they usually come to us saying, hey, okay, we need help and they need to be polished off, right? Because they want to try to self-implement it, which is fine. They're learning the systems, they're learning the tools, but typically, most people just want it as a service board. That's how I know ConnectWise kind of does talk about it, right, initially. And most of our implementations are that way. Being part of Advantage Partner Program, we do the full system setup. Um, now, we're very limited in our scope and capabilities within that because we simply want to get them up and running as quickly as possible so they're using the platform typically service desk 
most clients, you know, they have some agreement set up, um, but usually, you know, then the sales side of things are not really using the opportunities because that's most smaller MSPs don't really have a sales person. It's just the owner. And they're like, oh, we just, I'll do this through Excel sheets or email, right? So there's always been this, especially with the earlier adopters, right? We're talking about the guys who are still putting this on a server that they can touch versus like, hey, I don't want to ever see a server again. It's your problem. I would assume most are going the, I don't ever want to see a server again, SaaS model, but do you still see people deploy this on their own servers? And if so, what? We do uh, see, you know, especially uh, uh, there's always like the, uh, I'll speak to automate here. Um, we just got done with a webinar last month. You know, everybody's like, oh, automate's dead. It's going away because of CWRMM. And that's simply not the case because there is always a case for having your own on-prem device that you can manage the security around it and so forth. Same with ConnectWise PSA, right? There isn't always a need. Some environments will need that on-prem. Now we typically only see that in the enterprise type space. I will say any users that are typically 50 or more users, we typically see them kind of go on-prem. Uh, occasionally we'll see the smaller guys, but then it's it's like, hey, it doesn't make sense. They do shift to the cloud. Right. Um, you know, because bringing on on prem, there's all sorts of needs. You have direct access to the database. You can, you know, create your own reports You're through Power BI. There's there's a lot. And George, you know this, right? Right. You have your own database access. You can do whatever you want with that because you have direct access to SQL. I mean, there's all the, the, the so much. It's It's a very powerful tool with all the data. I mean, OK, so let's go there. Right. Most MSPs do not have the internal resources to get that data and make it useful, right? Like Correct. create the reports, yep. create the things that they can measure, watch a dashboard running on the regular. Like obviously there's tools, right? Bright Gauge is very popular and yep. you can pull data in and they've kind of tried to fish your prices as much as you can, right? Because they like prefabricate stuff. But let's be honest, right? I'm talking early days of George ConnectWise, it's called 2010. To get that data out of there. And make it useful was not easy. And to be honest with you, if you're trying to go off of even the pre can stuff, still kind of not like it's so language. It's tough. I think it's the the probably the, the problem is with a lot of the data is improper input. That's not be, it's just not simply inputs not being done correctly, right? Or the system's not structured appropriately. Uh, how your service board. So if you're trying to look at certain reports. And try to understand those certain reports. Well, the, usually the cause is because, well, we didn't set up a service board right to tag at that right department, or that it didn't have the cost on the engineers. So we don't know our agreement gross profitability on our agreements um, or a profitability on projects, right? So again, when, when we do a discovery session, the first 30 days of our projects, we kind of do see those things happen. And there's a lot of quick fixes around that, right? Jumping in, adjusting the burden cost. And actually showing some of these reports, actually starting to see the our momentum, if you will, in our integration projects. You know, it's interesting. And, you know, uh, I know like guys like Larry over at MSP CFO has a great tool around this, but like the amount of companies out there that other than very casually eyeballing it, don't really know if they're profitable on a specific customer or not. Like they can say, hey, man, that customer calls every day. And so I, they can't be profitable based on how many calls we take from them. Or it's, yeah, like we're just not charging them enough because we haven't changed our price in five years or whatever. But I would argue that there's a lot of people that I've walked to down any event that I've ever been to who will say, I have an idea, but I couldn't tell you for sure. <laughs> this goes back to my story. Uh, when I was in 2007, 2008, I had a couple clients that I thought were really profitable. I wasn't measuring appropriately and we were losing our butts off of them, losing cash. And we have to be able to measure that. And, and you know, MSP CFO is a tool that does, does a lot of that great stuff and um, making sure your systems are configured and properly set up. Like it, it's really super important to be able to measure it and understand the data behind it. So I would argue one of the first things that anybody should do based on what you just said, Adam, is like 
the MSP business can be a profitable one, but it's surely not an easy one. I'd argue it's a very hard business, to be honest. Um, a lot of people back into this because they were just really good at tech, right? And then like they became impromptu business owners like yourself and like myself. Um, it's hard to let customers go too, right? Because you worked really hard to build up your business, but there is something to be said for if my business, if I'm servicing, if, you know, somebody just mentioned in a, in a podcast two or three ago here, they're like, hey, you're bringing in new customers and you're taking your new money to pay for the old money that's now negative, right? And so in reality, you're just borrowing from the left to cover the, 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 the pain point on the right that shouldn't exist, right? For sure. And that's, it's, it's challenging. Right. And so I know there's new resources out there and uh, you know, I'll, I'll say like a chat tool and can give some good recommendations around, Hey, what should an email look like for price increases? You sh I do recommend having price increases every year and, and structuring that. And, and again, there's so much like running an MSP business is difficult in and of itself. It doesn't have to be hard though. It, like it, it's with the technology that's out there today, the remote tools that are out there today, man, back in 2002, when I started this thing, it was just a completely different, like we were rolling trucks <laughs> back then. And that was, that was pricey. Now, you know, with, I was going to say control, but now it's back to screen connect. <laughs> so, so we're switching up names again. Um, it's just, it's the remote capabilities today and the data that you can get it's amazing. So making sure you manage that remote workforce, manage those technicians, um, it's super important. And, and ConnectWise does connect all those pieces together. So obviously it's been talked about probably into the ground, but at this point, I think most IT shops have learned that they can hire outside of their city, metro, time zone, country even. You know, they're, they're doing the kind of follow the sun support, they're hiring people in different time zones. But it's sometimes difficult to make sure that those people are very productive when they're in their own man cave, I don't know, basement, uh, living room, whatever it is, right? So what are some of the things that you recommend that are like there that people don't realize that can help them make sure that everybody's doing the work? For sure. So it's really important to have dispatchers and managers uh, actually review timesheets on a daily basis. What's going on? Making sure you have the appropriate time entry, um, and really making sure you have again the right staff with the right culture. Um, it is really like above all these other systems and operations and all that stuff that we work on. We don't do any executive coaching, and I'll just throw out you know Jamison West and ConnectStrat. They do an amazing job at it, and, and you know they work on the executive level. But having the proper vision and making sure everybody's rolling the same direction and hiring the right people for the right seat. And having KPIs around those seats, they know what their targets are going to be. They know what they need to hit. They know the, what, how much time they need to put in. And if you don't hit those numbers and you're working remote, there's got to be some disciplinary action. So that's whether you're going to be on a PIP. Hey, if you get a couple of PIPs and really having people accountable, right? Let them go. Like, I'm serious about this. Like, it, it's <laughs> it, it's so just I, you have to hold I, people I accountable. I have a comment about that. Go ahead. I Keith. think that and it's probably not very popular, but that's okay. Um, I look at it and say most of the customers that are not great customers are because we train them poorly. And, hmm. and I look at that and I say, when you let a customer go, look at yourself first. You go, they call me too much. Is that because you really haven't implemented a good customer experience service system and have it is, do you penalize them for putting in a ticket because you're not responding to the tickets, ergo forcing them to call your top tech because that's the only way it gets solved. So I think a lot of it, ha and it's the same with your, your employees. You had a bad employee and you have to look at it and say, is it because I didn't have the structure in place to help him become successful and align with what I want? And that's where I look to Adam, I'm putting a lot of pressure on it because we just signed up. That's why I'm looking for their group to say, help us implement this so that when I tell a customer, open a ticket through chat or through the system thing, and so that, that we have the right workflows to make sure that's just as good as picking up the cell and bothering me. Hmm. Maybe even better, because he's probably getting someone more aligned to fix his problem, you know, than, than what I specialize in. 
you always bring up the blue light special comment. I'm going to apply that here. Um, customer experience is a, it's not a black or white thing, right? Like there's a lot of surveying that you need to get formal or informal in order to understand how your customers want to be worked with, right? Because like, if you're dictating to them, Hey, this is just how, how it goes. You know, here's a McDonald's menu, press one, press two, press three. That's it. Yeah. That, that doesn't necessarily fit everyone. Right. And you're in a very custom industry, Keith, with what you do. I assume that there's a lot of discussion from your customer on the way they want to you know, work with you rather than the reverse. Am I wrong? For us, there's, there's, I mean, we basically, I have found, and people disagree with me a lot that, you know, you put away the Kmart blue light and you offer the Nordstrom service level and you stop getting at, we have no, no customer that asks us, what am I paying per device or user? It's not even a topic of conversation. N neither is our staff. W what it is, is how we're integrating with their system, their support, and what we've done that other people don't offer to do. Okay. Adam, I mean, we could probably have a whole hour conversation about customer experience, but oh, there's yeah. a lot of cool options out there, right? To like enhance, right? But, you know, I argue all the time, like in today's, 2023 world how many people don't want to interact with a human being and maybe would rather talk to a chat bot or an sms line you know number versus like i just want to talk to somebody and solve my problem you know like i laugh and and chuckle and and i'll continue bringing this up until maybe they change your mind not that i fly frontier airlines all the time but they deleted their phone number app you can't get a hold of a human being now. you got to go by chat bot and I personally sure. would never, I would never fly them specifically for that. I don't care how much they save me. When I go to the airport, I want to, I want it to be, uh, I don't want it to add to my stress and I'm more efficient, you know, being ready to work and spending that time in the lounge, you know, doing my work than sitting in line and arguing about what seat I'm going to sit in. I, I mean, listen, I'm all, I'm going to let Adam respond for a second, but like, I'm all for saving a buck. Don't get me wrong. But like, it's when I'm, it's when there's a disruption, right? Like something didn't go according to plan and I need to fix that problem now, but I have nobody to talk to. I have a chat bot. Yeah. So there's obviously the cost of opportunity and um, outside of like just getting systems configured and everything, you have to provide a good experience. It, it, it's you will not exist in business if you do not provide a good experience, hands down. And so, you know, we've worked to actually, we walk our clients through a proven process. So um, we walk through every single step, we explain every single step. So we set the expectation right up front what the client experience is gonna be like. And, and I think that being an engineer, right? And you just started an MSP business, it's like, uh, I don't wanna generalize it, but typically introverts that are very challenging to, 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 to talk and engage in a good business conversation, you truly need to understand their business. And I think it'll actually help you understand your own business too. And so it's either like as an owner or as a business leader, it's either, I'm going to say this, and I don't know, you can mute it later, get curious or get the fuck out. <laughs> okay, so, I'm going to quote you, forget deleting. <laughs> and I think that if people actually get curious about like, that engagement with clients and if they get curious about how are the how are your clients actually making money and curious how i could actually use the technology in their business will help you understand how your services can help them more right and it's having that curious mindset taking that initiative and it's like that's the challenge with you know chat gpt and then you know just doing via text it's like hey well what's the best experience you're going to give clients. Now, I, I am 100% Delta. I am a fanboy of Delta. I'm just about to hit my million miles. I would think I'll hit it towards the end of this year. Uh, and unfortunately, I hate thinking about that because you're like, that's a lot of butts and hours and seats <laughs> if you start thinking about it. And they provide a really amazing experience. But I've also known lately, I've actually, when I need support, texting them they actually have a special text and it's kind of like a bot but then it, they'll actually get you in touch with a representative and 
they're actually able to resolve my issues way faster than I was when I'm calling and actually talking. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just simply want my issues resolved fast and uh, and and correctly, right? Um, so that's that's I know Delta is providing that good experience through chat, um, but I know that they do also provide it via phone call as well. Now, you know when you're talking about Frontier removing phone numbers, but you sign up what you get, you, you pay for what you get right? You do pay for what you get. And there's an opportunity cost that's lost there. If you go that way, right? Because then you like realize once you check in, oh, I got to pay for a bag. Oh, I don't know if this is true or not. But I oh, I need to now pay for a bathroom. Yes. Or I have to pay for my drinks. <laughs> but I, I think I did get I did get punked the first time I tried it. Somebody said, did you get your quarters? I'm like, what are you talking about? I actually went and got quarters. When you relate it to our business, I've always said people don't people don't walk into Kmart and accept being abused because they paid less. They walk into Kmart expecting the Nordstrom experience. They want the crap they went in there to be there. They want the store to be clean and they don't want to wait in line. So you're going like, why not have your customer pay for what they're expecting? Which is, why don't you start charging from the Nordstrom experience and providing it? Because that's what they want. You don't benefit. I've never heard someone say, I'll, I'll take this crappy service because I paid less. Look at all the people that complained about Southwest when they had their problems. Southwest was a crappy discount airline, period. You went there for price. You went there for the $59 special. You didn't care about sitting in first class. You didn't mind being hoarded into groups. You would conform to that. And as soon as it went bad, look at all the people bitching. I didn't, I didn't see anyone post, it's okay for them to abuse me. I paid less. <laughs> let me let me throw the last, I don't know, crystal question I like to call it, a million dollar question. How easy is it to calculate the like first call close, right? Call it the hole in one, right? Like a lot of people say, like that's some magic metric, if you would, in the MSP space, right? How many first call resolutions can we create? Because back to your point, if you can solve the problem and solve it fast and solve it right, generally, it, it does usually mean a happy customer, right? It generally does. Now, again, the asterisk is always, can you even measure that? Can you get to that point? Because quite often, systems are not configured that way at all with the proper ticket summary line, the proper description on the ticket, item, subtype, right? And then you can automatically flag tickets and, and that it's just, it. there are metrics in there. I, Bright Gauge has some metrics and on, on, you know, first time close and resolutions and all that stuff. But we often find that the data is not the best when it comes to that because tickets are not, in, there's not a consistent pattern to how the tickets are input. Um, and it, it's, it's certainly challenging, um, but we have to measure there's, you know, I think I have a blog on my site on the key KPIs a service department should be looking at. Um, and, and that is, that is one of the metrics and how best to, to accomplish that. Um, and so it's, it's forever question, right? Right. I mean, it's just one of those things just like, wow, I'm like, I talked about time entry two months ago and it's like one of our biggest webinars and it's like, wow, this is, I was still dealing with this 20 years ago. <laughs> I, I like that answer. It's interesting because I think people have different views. I always think on the first call, what the customer wants is the assurance that they've reached someone that really gives a shit and is going mm -hmm. to help them. I don't even think, you know, I had a problem with Home Depot just the other day where something was delivered without parts. Oh, and the guy said, oh, it's going to take two weeks to get it. But they keep following. He goes, I promise I'll send you an email every couple of days on the status of the, and you're going like, Okay, I'm okay. I really wanted him to tell me I can come to your store and pick it up right now. But minus that, the fact that someone cares and follows up, I go, I'm good. I'm fine. You know, uh, and, and I think that's what we look at. And I, and I always, not that KPIs are not a value. I sometimes believe you get so KPI focused, you forget about experience and talking to your customers, especially when they, I had someone say, I make sure my, Techs don't spend four to five minutes on these re remedial tickets. I'm going like, oh, that's kind of shitty. Then how do they know what's going on at the company if there isn't a dialogue about how are things going and, and keeping that relationship? So I think KPIs can be 
um, tricky to manage and, and, and really dig down. Well, I think the key thought that I took from both of you was only as good as the data that feeds it. If it can be a false flag, if it's just dirty information, right? You're making decisions off of inaccuracy, basically. Nothing beats picking up the phone and calling your customer and say, hey, how's my guys doing? Exactly. I mean, that's there's, the there's, there's no automation you'll get to replace that. That's exactly right. That's the client experience things for sure. And so there's some definitely truth to that. I think that just having the proper KPIs in your business and measuring those KPIs on a regular cadence and then taking action on when those metrics and knowing how to take the action and take appropriate action on those uh, is really, really key for running an MSP business to make it easier at the end of the day. There it is. Adam, where do, find, where do people find out more about what your company does, what services you offer, maybe who they can talk to if they think they need your help? Man, uh, there's a lot. So I run ConnectWise Boss Facebook group, ConnectWise Tips and Tricks Facebook group, but also you can just check out sierrapacificgroup.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. Check out LinkedIn. Uh, I do Pitch It every Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern. So Pitch It's another cool thing when it, a lot of new innovations come into the marketplace, a lot of software tools. Again, I'm not an advocate, you know, going out and buying every single one of them. I'm more of like, hey, let's figure out, let's look at these solutions, how they're going to help solve problems because it's really, really cool. So um, check us out. I go live all the time on every Wednesday. So awesome. Appreciate it. Adam, really appreciate you taking an hour out of your life to come and just, you know, shoot down the magic questions because some of those just are for 20 years that keep being asked. And I'm like, I wonder if anybody's going to ever like finally put a nail in some of these. Yeah. Awesome. And Keith, I'll be sure and say hi to your son. It's secure. Are you going to be at secure? I'll be there. I will be at secure. I ordered right, some, well, well, I ordered since some have, t-shirts. Since we have 60 seconds. Yeah. So if anybody hasn't, didn't know, right? You know, the mid-year ConnectWise events now called IT Nation Secure. So Google it, right? IT Nation Secure. It's in Orlando. Surprise, surprise, like half the MSB events out there. And in Florida, um, I still think you can get there. I still think there are, you know, you can register and go. So check it out. If Especially if you don't think you have all the security stuff, you know, buttoned up in your business, could be a good kind of forum to see what's out there, right? For sure. Definitely. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, George. Been, been great. Thanks, Keith, for jumping in here, too. Got it. This session was recorded. You'll find it at mspinitiative.com. We'll catch you on the next one. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Good luck. Right. Appreciate it. Bye.